So I'll get things started for the day. Like we'll start with pathoanatomy of transverse fractures, and I'll also give you a brief overview about the concepts and uh, principles that you need to understand in treating this fracture successfully. So as you might be already aware that transverse fracture is defined by a fracture line that runs in an anterior posterior direction, dividing the acetabular cavity into two. You have a cranial and a caudal segment. In spite of disrupting both columns, the transverse fracture is still classified as elementary under the lateral description because you have only one primary fracture line. This is much different from all other associated patterns which have more than one primary fracture line. So this is why a transverse fracture is classified as an elementary fracture. So if you look at the two acetabular segments, you have one cranial segment also called as iliac segment, which is attached to the axial skeleton at the level of the SI joint. So this segment does not move or displace, and you can even call this a constant segment. The segment which, that, which displaces is the inferior or the ischiopubic segment. This is the one which displaces, and this is the one that you need to reduce onto the constant fragment to reconstruct the articular surface at the level of the acetabulum. So if you look at the prevalence of transverse fractures in the lateral series, it was around 7.5 percentage. And in most of the modern series, if you look at the TANAST one, it is around 3%. And if you look at the uh, meta-analysis from Peter Ganudis, it's around 8.3%. I'm talking only about the pure transverse fractures. Of course, the transverse posterior wall variety will have a more incidence. So most modern series reported incidence are around 5 to 15%. If you look at the morphological subtypes, there are three. They are classified depending upon the level at which the fracture line disrupts the acetabular chondral surface. So depending on that, you can have an infratectal fracture, which has a fracture line running through the cotyloid fossa, a juxtatectal fracture, where the fracture line runs on top of the cotyloid fossa, and then the transtectal fracture, which has a fracture line running right through the weight-bearing dome of the acetabulum. And for this reason, transtectal fracture as a much poorer prognosis if you do not get the reconstruction anatomical. Even though the name says transverse, hardly the fracture is ever transverse. The obliquity of the fracture line can vary significantly in all three planes, namely anterior to posterior, medial to lateral, and horizontal to vertical. And if you look at the morphological types, most often the infratectal fracture is the one which in which the fracture line is often transverse. But as you go higher into the juxta and the transtectal ones, fracture line obliquity varies significantly. And the transtectal fractures can almost always be sagittal or vertical in orientation. And what level of the acetabulum fractures will depend primarily upon the direction of the force vector that drives the femoral edge into the acetabulum. Depending on that, if you have a force vector that drives the femoral edge into the dome of the acetabulum, you can have a transtectal fracture and the femoral head can also displace significantly in the medial direction. With regards to displacements, there are two axes along which a transverse fracture can show displacements. One is an imaginary vertical axis running along the pubic symphysis. This is the anterior inch. So based on this anterior inch as a fulcrum, the ischiopubic segment can rotate. So since the anterior inch is intact, most of the displacements are seen on the posterior side as invert migration or translation accompanied by rotation. The other axis on which the ischiopubic segment can rotate or displace is the fracture axis running from the pubic symphysis onto the posterior fracture line. So if you look at the CD scans on the right, that shows you the typical displacement pattern seen in a transverse fracture. You can see the posterior limb is much displaced in the medial direction compared to the anterior limb of the fracture. To make you understand these displacements a little bit better, I have just projected the axis on this AP X-ray. If you look at this, is the fracture axis. Based on this axis, the ischiopubic segment can rotate with the proximal segment moving inwards and the ischial, segment, ischial tuberosity being pushed laterally. Also, the other axis is the vertical axis running through the symphysis on which the entire ischiopubic segment can rotate, creating more displacements posteriorly. 
Of course, this is not always the case. You have to understand there are special situations where the constant fragment or the iliac fragment is no more the constant fragment. This can happen when there is an SI joint disruption, which is most commonly partial, disrupting the anterior part of the SI joint. And in these cases, if you are going to rely on the proximal segment to base your reductions, you are not going to get it right. So you need to get the SI joint reduced first in order to get your fracture reduction precisely. Another situation would be where the anterior hinge is disrupted. This can happen when you have a symphysial disruption or a fracture of the contral lateral pubic ramus. In this case, you do not have an anterior hinge that is intact on which basis you can derotate your ischiopelvic segment. So in these cases, you need to again fix the anterior pelvic ring first before going again with reduction of the transverse fracture. Pelvic ring injuries are rarely associated with acetabular fractures, but they are most commonly seen with transverse fractures, which account for almost 60% of such injuries. So you need to be careful about reading your radiological pictures. How does this injury occur? They are tra the transverse fractures occur typically by forces that drive the femoral head into the acetabular. And how the fracture happens and where it happens will depend on a lot of factors. One would be hip position, whether the hip is flexed, extended, or whether there is abduction or adduction. The second thing would be the direction of force, whether there is a force vector coming from the lateral direction through the greater trochanter. Other things would be dashboard injuries where you have fracture transmitted along the femur and also when the hip is extended from the foot. Other thing to consider would be the limb rotation, whether the limb is internally or externally rotated. Based on these factors, you can get a different morphological types of transverse fractures. The most common injury mechanism that causes these fractures would be lateral impact from the greater trochanter, which can produce all three types of fractures depending on hip position and limb rotation. The second most common mechanism would be an axial injury with the hip in extension, which will cause a transtectal fracture. This is commonly seen after fall from heights. The third mechanism would be dashboard injuries where the, where the load is transmitted from the knee with the hip inflection, this commonly produces transverse with posterior wall injuries. Just to highlight the most common mechanism from the lateral side a little bit better, this is how the force is transmitted on the greater trochanter in a limb that is internally rotated. And depending on whether the hip is abducted, you can get an infratectal fracture and increasing amounts of neutrality and adduction, you can get fractures that exit a little bit higher, either the trans or the juxtatectal. Depending on where your fracture is, the femoral head can stay under the dome, which is commonly seen in infratectal varieties, and it can also displace with the ischiopelvic segment in a medial direction, which is commonly seen in transtectal types. And if that is the case, the femoral head can be subjected to a lot of chondral damage, and you may have to consider transient lateral traction before you get into definitive fixation. How are these fractures assessed by routine radiography? AP and Jude views have to be taken. Jude views will tell you where exactly the fracture is ex exiting at the column so that you can plan your approach. It will also tell you where the displacements are more. To assess final details, CT scans are extremely useful. And why does the stance of fracture looks vertical or sagittal on the CT scan? Then why it appears like that is because how we take the CT scan. We take the CT scan in with the acetabulum in an anatomical position with the acetabular articular surface facing laterally and also inferiorly. So if you come from cranial to caudal, you will see the fracture lines running from medial to lateral direction. And the lateral segment or the lateral uh, fragment that you see from when you come from above would be the iliac segment. And the medial segment would be the ischiopubic segment. So since the transverse fracture divides these two segments into two, the fracture line appears vertical, splitting these two columns, splitting these two fragments into two. So this is why a transverse fracture looks vertical or sagittal on an axial CT scan. Three-dimensional three CT images can give you a great in deal of information about overall displacements and also gives you a spatial orientation of the fracture relationship of these two segments to each other. But for finer details, you still have to look at the 2D axials so that you do not miss a dome involvement 
It also tells you about associated pelvic injuries like partial SI joint injuries and subtle symphysal disruption. You can also assess the congruency of the femoral head with the weight bearing dome and also look at associated fractures like the femoral head and the posterior wall. Sometimes transverse fractures can be conserved provided the EP is stable. The concept of stability was put forward by Mata in his roof work measurements where you draw a vertical line to the geometric center of the acetabulum and then subtend a tangential line which runs to the fracture line. If you have an intact angle of more than 45 degrees, then you have sufficient roof arc for that fracture to be treated conservatively. And they extended this concept to the CT scans where if you have an intact subcontral roof arc of greater than 10 mm, when you run from cranial to caudal on the axials, then it corresponds to an intact roof arc of 45 degrees. So if you have the hip stable enough, then these fractures can be conserved provided there is not much of displacement, especially at the tectal level, more amounts of displacements can be accepted at infratectal levels and your femoral edge should be congruent with the weight bearing dome in all three views without traction. So if you can satisfy all these criteria, those fractures can be conserved. If you look at the biomechanics of transverse fractures, especially the transtectal ones, they are extremely forgiving, unforgiving. If you have more than one millimeter displacement, it increases contact peak pressures by more than 20 percentage and that goes up to 50 percentage if you have more than 2 mm displacements. Whenever displacements are more at the dome level to the tune of more than 2 mm, there is a fourfold increase in joint narrowing within a space of one year. So as, as the fracture level goes higher and higher into the tectum, you need to be really careful these fractures require an anatomical reduction. This is again to highlight the same thing uh, intact roof arc in a transtectal fracture is often less than 3 mm. So these fractures require precise reduction, sometimes more than a single approach, sometimes articular access as well, and you need to reduce them anatomically. So what would be the optimal surgical approach? It will depend on a lot of factors. Primary displacement at the columns. If you look at the image on the right side, if you have an anterior column that is opened up, Hinging on the posterior column that you might have to go anterior, contrarily, you may have to go posteriorly if your posterior column opens up a more. You also have to consider the obliquity of the fracture. You need to prioritize the fracture line which exits at an higher level because this is more likely to involve the dome. You also look at the level of the fracture, comminution, because if you have a comminuted fracture at a particular limb, that limb may not be amenable to indirect reduction and also consider associated injuries in the pelvis. So, the surgical approach, KL, is the workhorse, but you can use almost every other surgical approach that you use to, that you can think of in treating an acetabular fracture. When to use where would be covered in detail by subsequent talks. And the question is like, is one approach sufficient for transverse fractures? Yes, most of the time, but you have to remember the care. As already discussed, whenever you have a disruption of the SI joint, a broken anterior hinge at the symphysis, this might require more than one approaches. Transsectal fractures, because it is difficult to control the other limb at that level, as I at that level. And you also need an anatomical reduction. And the fourth one would be when you have an associated extended posterior wall pattern. I think these things will be discussed in the coming talks. What about fracture biomechanics? Transverse fractures require a combined anterior posterior stabilization, period. You cannot stabilize one column with screws and think that will be sufficient because you can lose reduction over a period of time. But it doesn't mean that you need to do two approaches. A single approach is sufficient. A single approach focusing on columnar plating, preferably with two plates, and an indirect reduction of the other column, and fix 6.5 mm screw provided the best possible construct. But posterior, the anterior column window has only around 6.5 millimeters on an average. So inserting a 6.5 screw or three 3.5 screws may not be realistically possible all the time. So in that case, most of the time, this is what a, a type of constraint that will be ending up with, which is more than sufficient. If you are doing this from anterior, then your posterior column has a much bigger window through which a 6.5 screw can be inserted. In terms of results, if you can get good reduction, transverse fractures tend to do pretty well. Transrectal fractures especially require anatomical reduction. How to get those? would be discussed in subsequent talks. So in summary, transverse fractures are elementary, but are probably as complex as the posterior wall. You need to understand the pathoanatomy in order to plan your surgical strategy. 
often one surgical approach is enough kale usually but you need to understand there is might a need for other or extensive surgical approaches as well which might be desired on case to case in terms of fixation combined anteroposterior fixation through a single approach is sufficient thank you that was a very fantastic presentation dr ashok very well described very much in detail and fantastic illustrations okay i now invite dr srinivas kasha for his talk dr kasha can you share your screen yes very good Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes. Can you see my presentation? Yeah. So. after a wonderful talk by dr ashok uh, my talk would be dealing with anterior indications reduction and fixation tips in transverse fracture as tablet able to go forward actually yeah yeah so as we have seen uh, the fracture line Uh, in transverse fracture divide the hemi pelvis into two parts through some portion of the acetabulum therefore although both columns are divided it is not a both column fracture the issue pubic component is intact the integrity is maintained and that is represented radiologically by obturator uh, ring intact intactness and uh, so if that is broken either by inferior pubic ramus uh, uh, the in integrity of issue pubic component is gone then it could either be a bicolumnar or a t shaped or any other complex kind of a fracture so the choice of optimal approach which is already been covered by ashok uh, mainly depends on the column with greatest involvement direction of rotation and displacement height of the fracture and obliquity of the fracture presence of impaction also guides uh, to what approach we have to take and involvement of acetabular wall so when there is associated posterior uh, wall fracture then it is, it might be needing uh, posterior approach to start with and probably some uh, approach or through posterior indirect indirect reduction methods fixation of the anterior column either with a screw can also be done the possible approaches are for a transverse fracture uh, either anterior or posterior sometimes combined so and in combined approaches also anterior uh, first and posterior first so when to choose anterior to start with anterior when to choose to start with posterior is the one which we are going to see with few examples so these are the anterior uh, approaches anterior intrapelvic approach uh, which usually has a direct visibility of superior pubic ramus and supraacetabular area quadrilateral plate up to sa joint and part of the posterior column too and ilioinguinal approach which is like uh, like a workhorse approach for anterior acetabulum uh, covers most of the ilium and uh, inlet of the pelvis uh, up to quadrilateral surface and uh, you can also reach uh, a part of the posterior column and the ilio femoral approach is mainly uh, iliac fossa is very well visualized and in indirect methods or with finger palpation you can go to the inlet of the pelvis let me take you through a case example here in this 
you have got iliopectineal line, ilioischial line, both are broken, and uh, uh, ilio ischiopubic integrity is maintained. And uh, if you see the pathoanatomy of this particular uh, fracture, so displaced anterior uh, column fracture with uh, comminution is there, and displaced posterior column fracture. And there is a symphysis injury and SI joint injury on the opposite side and quadrilateral plate, which is also displaced. And if you see, there is a posterior wall fracture associated with this. So uh, I kept this particular example because these are the factors which usually uh, are needed to take a decision whether to go anteriorly first or a posteriorly first. So associated symphysis injury and SI joint injury usually uh, needs an anterior approach first, whereas associated posterior wall fracture usually takes us to posterior side first to start with. The aim of surgery is anterior column reduction, anterior column fixation, anterior wall or the dome fragment reduction and fixation, associated pelvic injury to be addressed in the same thing, and posterior column reduction, posterior column fixation, and of course, posterior wall reduction and fixation. So if you see this, through anterior approach, you can address anterior column fracture, reduction, anterior column fixation, anterior wall fragment reduction and fixation and associated pelvic injury can also be addressed if you go anteriorly and by indirect methods or by pushing uh, in this particular case with a ball spike pusher you can also reduce posterior column but posterior column fixation uh, uh, may not be possible if you want to put a plate but if you want to go ahead with just a screw fixation it is possible because there is a posterior wall also associated with it, it obviously needs posterior approach along with this particular approach. And of course, posterior wall fixation. These three things are not possible and which needs uh, second approach. So if you start with anterior approach first, so you can reduce the pelvic part as well as the acetabular part and the anterior column which is comminuted can also be addressed and the posterior column reduction can also be achieved. So here I have started with the uh, uh, traction using a pin to the trochanter and uh, uh, buttressing the quadrilateral uh, surface with a ball spike pusher. These are the things which are used in reduction in this particular case and there is a buttress plate on the inlet and Along with that, anterior column is fixed with the symphysis pubis fixation and SI joint fixation, followed by patient is turned on to the lateral position and the posterior wall is also fixed. That is outcome after four years. So in this particular example, we come to know that associated pelvic injury and uh, more displacement on the anterior side will take us anteriorly first to get the reduction achieved. And it's here is a second uh, example wherein you've got iliopectineal and ilioischial line, both are gone, although the integrity of uh, 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 pubic uh, segment is intact. And that is the CT scan, which you can see. So here, if you see, uh, the columns are not much displaced, but there is this particular thing, which is clearly visible, is articular impaction or a gull sign, which is positive in this particular thing, which has to be addressed during fixation, which can only be addressed if you go anteriorly, either by an iliofemoral or a stopas approach. In this case, I took a stopas approach, and the articular segment is being elevated uh, with a spike there, if you can see in the second picture. And in the third picture, it's reduced, and we have used uh, calcium sulfate paste there, and we have put a screw 
followed by anterior column fixation. And later patient is turned on to the other side and the posterior column is also fixed with the plate. So anterior approach is first to be done also in articular impaction, especially in the anterior side, uh, which is easily addressed by anterior intrapelvic approach or uh, iliofemoral approach. Uh, here is another example, uh, a similar kind of a case. Uh, you got but there is no much displacement on the posterior side, which was managed through intrapelvic only. Uh, and this L plate is buttressed, the third picture which is shown, is buttressing the uh, posterior column part. And uh, that is the reduction achieved and nothing was used, uh, nor even uh, screw for the posterior column in this case. Anterior approach alone, and that is after an year of outcome. So here is another example, 45 year old uh, with a transverse fracture. And uh, so the reduction manuals, obviously in these kind of thing, usually if it is, uh, if, you, if we are operating within two to three days, then probably just a traction will uh, suffice. But when it is uh, delayed, then probably a trochanteric pin is a must and uh, uh, the instruments which are used during uh, reduction are you know, uh, bone spike and collinear clamp, as well as offset clamp like in the third picture here. And uh, the same thing was fixed with anterior intrapelvic approach and uh, percutaneous posterior column screw. So anterior approach and posterior column screw and that is the outcome. And here is another example, 50 year old male. That is the CT scan. So posterior column is relatively less displaced in here. So it, it's fixed to anterior intrapelvic approach and then uh, followed by posterior column fixation through uh, KL approach. And uh, so it can also be uh, the anterior intrapelvic and you can also use a screw for the posterior column, something like this. So the take home message is uh, fracture pattern anatomy will dictate the approaches. Anterior first is usually in displaced anterior column compared to posterior and the articular impaction and associated pelvic fracture. Anterior first approach is very much needed and that's what it is. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Srinivas. You showed beautiful cases. And now I invite Dr. Krishna Kiran to share his screen and start his presentation. Dr. Krishna Dr. Kiran from Hyderabad. Stop. Yeah. Can you see the screen, sir? Yes, we can see the. We can see you. You have not yet shared your screen. No. Not yet. Okay. Just give me a second. Yes, we can see your screen now. Right. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Yeah. Please go so, uh, good evening. My brief is to talk about when will I go posterior in transverse fractures. And my job has been made quite a bit easier by the previous speakers, Ashok and Srinivas, who have gone in detail about the uh, transverse fracture pathoanatomy and when uh, you would choose a particular approach, especially the anterior approach. There would be some repetition of uh, concept and uh, repetition will make the viewer understand better about this uh, transverse fracture. So please bear me, with me for the repetition part of it. So uh, Judith and Letornel described the transverse fracture as a basic type, and we must recognize the difference between a transtectal fracture, which goes through the weight-bearing dome, the juxtatectal fracture, which goes at the junction of the weight-bearing dome and the cotyloid fossa, and the infratectal fractures. And this has been very well described by Ashok. 
the interesting part is the acetabulum is divided into superior and inferior fragments on the uh, acetabulum but on the ct scan as ashok pointed out it is seen as a vertical line so this is how a transverse fracture will look on an axial ct it look like a vertical line and ashok described very well as to why it appears so there is a spectrum of obliquity between the axial and sagittal planes such that as the fracture becomes more cranial on the acetabular articular surface it becomes more sagittally oriented thereby separating a larger portion of the articular surface from the acetabular roof so this is an important concept and this has been shown before so the roof arc angle is an important concept but it may not be viable in patients with displaced transverse fractures and those transverse fractures associated with the posterior wall but it is a useful tool to evaluate intraoperatively and also to look at the uh, reduction parameters post postoperatively so in general if we want the anterior uh, and the superior weight bearing area to be intact the medial roof arc angle must be greater than 45 degrees and similarly on the iliac and obturator oblique views we must have anterior and posterior roof arc angles more than 45 and more than 62 degrees to get good congruity and stability after fixation so this is the aim of treatment of transverse acetabular fractures and of course some of the cases who have got this before surgery you can consider a non operative treatment especially the infratectal ones as has been suggested previously so there are several options for surgical approach and if you look at the literature majority of the options are with the cocker langenbach approach and uh, uh, although these have shown inferior outcomes in the original lateral series majority of the series have still focused on the posterior approach so you have options which include posterior approach with anterior column screw or a sequential approach where you do the posterior first followed by anterior or anterior followed by the posterior the extensile iliofemoral approach is now reserved for delayed cases and it's not generally employed because of the excessive morbidity associated with the procedure now there are four steps in choosing the correct approach you must look at the classification on x ray whether it's a juxtatectal fracture transtectal or an infratectal fracture if you have an infratectal fracture most of them can be managed with the posterior approach alone if you have a transtectal some of them can be managed with a posterior approach but it is a juxtatectal fractures which involve the weight bearing dome and those associated with dome impaction which definitely need a sequential approach or an anterior approach first the second thing which we must look at is the displacement on axial ct whether there is neutral displacement whether there is posterior displacement or anterior displacement so patients with neutral and posterior displacements can be managed with uh, posterior approach while those with anterior displacement definitely need the combined or anterior approach alone the third is the fracture obliquity on jude views whether there is a neutral obliquity high anterior or high posterior again neutral obliquity and high posterior can be dealt with the posterior approach but the high anterior obliquity definitely may need the anterior approach and the other thing is the extent of displacement now there is varying element of medial displacement and rotation of the ischio pubic segment and this can be measured by the extent of medial displacement uh, as shown in this particular figure now to summarize the posterior approach in transverse fractures is indicated in transtectal and infratectal fractures as a sequential approach for juxtatectal fractures associated with a posterior wall neutral and posterior displacement in axial ct high posterior obliquity of fracture line on jude views less than 10 mm displacement and transverse fractures associated with posterior wall so all of these can be treated through the cocker langenbach approach so you can see a case example you can uh, look at the ap x ray this is a transverse with posterior wall fracture you can see on the axial ct there is neutral displacement but there is significant amount of gap and there is a high anterior and low posterior on the jude view so you can see that by the arrows so this particular case will require a sequential approach anterior first followed by the posterior which was done and the hip was restored to normal congruency some points for a safe surgical technique the infra and transtectal fractures transverse with posterior wall can be dealt with posterior approach juxta textal high anterior may need sequential approach the lateral de decubitus will allow for both approaches but in patients with lateral decubitus the disadvantage is sometimes the ischio pubic segment cannot be derotated adequately and the gravity will not be a friend if you are only planning a posterior approach a prone position is better 
because the prone position will take care of the gravity and you can also externally rotate the fragment by putting a shan spin into the into the ischium the challenge with the prone position is if you need to address an extended wall fragment on the posterior side you will not be able to do a extended trochanteric uh, uh, a short trochanteric osteotomy like the gans osteotomy to you know access the anterior part of the posterior wall the key points for the posterior approach are protection of sciatic nerve extending the hip and flexing the knee although seems the basic point but needs to be adhered to throughout the surgical technique one must be aware of the risks with anterior column screw especially the anterior superior penetration and risk for neurovascular injury when it is being inserted from the posterior approach these are all the areas which the coker like langenbach uh, approach gives us access to regarding the operative procedure the key tricks are to release the piriformis and short sectional rotators 1.5 cm from the trochanter we must protect the quadratus and operator externus at all costs because we don't want to injure the ascending branch of the medial circumflex femoral artery the anterior column and quadrilateral plate reduction are done through digital palpation through the sciatic notch and one must be careful and give repeated uh, you must remove the retractor Uh, time and again and not keep on retracting because of risk of injury to the sciatic nerve and one must be careful about the superior gluteal neurovascular bundle the insertion of a shan screw into the ischium with an attached t handle will help us derotate the fragment from the posterior approach and whenever there is a combined transverse with posterior wall the the column part the transverse part is addressed first and the wall is fixed next you can use a two screw technique with a farabouf clamp for secure reduction and if sequential approach is contemplated that is if we do the posterior first to fix the wall and the transverse part of the fracture and you want to fix the anterior column because of some reason you're not able to reduce it perfectly from the back the screw size must be 20 mm or lesser from the posterior if we put two long screws then it will engage and mal fix the anterior column in a uh, mal rotated position so this is the example of a, a shan spin being pushed pushed into the ischium and this can be used to derotate the fragment and the two screws are placed on either side of the fracture and the farabouf clamp is used uh, to uh, position it perpendicularly just like a posterior column injury and you can use your finger to digitally palpate the adequacy of reduction on the anterior side some case examples we can see that the uh, is your pubic fragment is rotated and the femoral head is medially displaced along with the uh, thing but the superior weight bearing dome is relatively intact and there is no uh, dome impaction in this particular case and we can see that the uh, it's a transtectal type of fracture on the ct scan and there is no uh, high anterior type of uh, thing so this can be attempted through the posterior approach although one may argue that you can do a sequential approach in this particular case so we did it through the uh, posterior approach and were able to fix the anterior column through an anterior column screw which was inserted from the retroacetabular area from the posterior to anterior direction and you can see that we were able to palpate the adequacy of reduction of the anterior column through the uh, sciatic notch another case example we can see a transverse with a, a posterior wall type of fracture which is more displaced posteriorly than anteriorly and the fracture line is more oblique posterior superiorly as compared to anterior inferiorly so this is again an indication of posterior approach first and then we may consider an anterior approach if we are not able to adequately reduce and address the anterior column from the back so that was what was done a posterior column fixation with a single plate and the posterior wall was fixed using two buttress uh, plates which were the spring plates so there is this paper on operative treatment of transverse acetabular fracture whether it is necessary to fix both the columns and this paper concluded that it was not necessary to fix both the columns if we are able to get good stability but we personally feel that it is a good idea to put an anterior column screw wherever possible and address both the columns because these injuries tend to be unstable and there can be displacement of the uh, fracture at a later date another case example we can see it's almost a transtectal type of uh, fracture and there is a significant anterior displacement and it's a high anterior type of lesion which needs to be addressed with a combined approach so in this particular case we did a anterior approach first through the modified stopas fixed the thing and we were not able to reduce the posterior column adequately uh, 
so we went back from the posterior approach and that is the follow up at around 7 years uh, after a sequential approach where the posterior approach was used in conjunction with the anterior approach to achieve good fixation of the acetabulum other indications for posterior approach are transverse with posterior wall fracture and in a associated posterior wall fracture we do not have a choice but to go posterior anyway so now the uh, current consensus is to go from the back fix the posterior column uh, the wall and column and see if we can put an anterior column screw if we are not able to get adequate reduction of the anterior column from the back then sometimes you may have to do a sequential approach where the posterior approach is done first so this is a transverse fracture with posterior wall involvement and posterior dislocation of hip which again constitutes an indication for posterior approach and similar strategy was employed the hip was approached from the back reduced the wall and column were fixed on the back and the anterior column was subsequently operated from the front and fixed through a modified stopas approach and that's the 6 month follow up showing good fracture healing sometimes in an extended wall fragment associated with a transverse fracture to visualize the wall fragment adequately we may have to extend the exposure by doing a gans type of flip osteotomy which gives us better access and offloads the superior gluteal neurovascular bundle finally patients with associated transverse fracture posterior wall and a fracture neck femur again may need uh, uh, one approach and this will require a posterior approach in this particular case in because of the wall fragment Uh, partly also because of the uh, prognosis of this particular injury uh, due to high risk of avascular necrosis was addressed through a single approach where the neck was fixed and the transverse fracture addressed through two plates in the posterior column so to summarize the posterior approach is indicated in patients with significant posterior obliquity displacement and where the anterior column involvement can be reduced from the posterior approach thank you very much thank you very much dr krishna kiran now before we move to the next two talks there are uh, three questions which are relevant to the exposures so i am going to ask those question and uh, each and every uh, uh, i mean faculty who is going to answer please raise your hand i will unmute you and then you can answer the question so the first question is uh, okay. it is uh, when we are going posterior after an anterior fixation then in that case whether you do it in prone position or in lateral position dr shrinivas since you have shown thus those cases i would request you to answer this question sure uh, so when combined approach is planned uh, it is better to be on lateral position and uh, i am all, i always do it in lateral position let it be a kl approach even for the Uh, isolated posterior column or isolated posterior wall fracture and co when combined approach is planned it is better to use some kind of a floppy lateral kind of a position because it saves lot of time for shifting the patient and redraping the patient so i nowadays i always choose to put them on a floppy lateral position and do an anterior uh, work first either stopas or a radio femoral turn the patient because you need not change the position it almost almost saves 1 to 1 and 1/2 hours for uh, you know anesthesia time either stopas or a radio femoral turn the patient okay anybody in the faculty who would want to do it differently please raise your hand okay i think we have a consensus over here no megul so, wants to say something the next question who wants to say megul something megul wants to say something megul 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 okay yes yes dr megul please one minute yes, uh, i just i just want to add to that that um yeah. doing it in the lateral position has a couple of other advantages as well so one of the other advantages is that if it is a comminuted uh, posterior column or an associated posterior wall then you can have and you've got marginal impaction posteriorly as well then you can access um, the whole of the joint by doing a surgical hip dislocation so you can achieve that in the lateral position um, and secondly um, it gives you an idea of your congruity and reduction of the anterior column as well so again doing a surgical hip dislocation will give you that access 
to visualize your anterior column reduction. So I think I don't always do a surgical hip dislocation, but I think it can be very, very helpful in certain cases. So I would do it in a lateral position. Okay. Yeah. So I think everybody prefers to do it in lateral position uh, after having done the anterior column fixation. Now the second question. The second question is, how can you be sure of a well reduced articular impaction? How do you uh, you know assure yourself that this articular impaction has been well reduced? I had asked that question to Dr. Ashok. Dr. Ashok, can you take that question? Dr. Ashok. Hello. Okay. Uh, I think Dr. Mehul, can you answer this question? Yeah, of course. So, so that was going to be one of my questions. I think it's really important um, topic to discuss, the impaction. And I think there are two schools of thought on how that impaction should be managed. And we saw a very nice case where the impaction was brought down through the anterior approach and then the quadrilateral plate of the anterior column was then closed over. Okay, well, that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is to reduce the columns and then create a window and then push that impaction down. And I think it's important to understand those two concepts. Okay, and some fractures and some types of impaction will allow some, others will allow others. So that's the first thing to understand. Second thing to understand is how, how we look at the reduction. And it's, it's like a tibial plateau fracture. You know, when you first start doing a tibial plateau fracture, you get it up to what you think is right. But when you look at the post-op imaging, it always sinks down a bit. So my rule of thumb is to always try and push it a little bit more than you think you need to. And then the third thing is, is supporting that. So it's really important to support that, whether you support it with graft, whether you support it um, with, with other, other ways. So if you put in artificial cement um, or other means of supporting it, you put in something to fill that void, but you also support it with raft screws. So all these things are really important in the technique. Once you've, once you've got that reduction, what I tend to do is I tend to look at all three Jude views, so the AP and the two Jude views, and then I usually get a post-op CT. So it's very difficult to know you've got it perfect intraoperatively, but the only way of doing it is visualization, okay, um, on the three views. And if you've got the opportunity to do a second posterior approach, then you can do a surgical hip dislocation again to look at your reduction. So I think that answers the uh, query. And now the last query, someone had asked uh, if we can do a ischial spine osteotomy to get better access to the quadrilateral plate and assess our reduction. So what's your take on it, uh, Dr. Ashok, is he here? Yes, sir, Dr. Ashok, please. Uh, I don't think an ischial spine osteotomy is a routine uh, to assess anterior column reduction through the sciatic notch, but like sometimes it might help, especially if the exit is like uh, slightly low on the anterior column. So like to put in your finger there, it might help, yeah, but it's rare. But where I would probably do that is like when I deal with a delayed case to derotate the uh, ischiopubic segment. So that is where it might probably help a little bit more. So it is only for a delayed case. That's what you are saying. Okay, we take it. Now we can move forward. And uh, I now invite Dr. Nikhil. And Dr. Nikhil is going to talk next. Dr. Nikhil, can you share your screen, please? Dr. Nikhil Shah, yes. please unmute yourself. Can you, can you see the screen now? Yes, we can see the screen and we can hear you very well. 
Right, so the remit of my talk is to deal with transverse and posterior wall fractures. Uh, thank you, Pradeep and Pranav, for this wonderful organization. So what I'll try and cover is some basic considerations in decision making, and a lot of this will be repetition, and you've already heard of this before. We'll look at the principles of management. I'll show some cases of acute fractures, and in brief, we'll deal with the outcomes, uh, specifically pertaining to transverse with posterior wall. And then if time permits, I'll show some delayed cases. So we know what a posterior wall fracture is, and we have seen what a transverse fracture is. In a posterior wall fracture, on the left of the screen, your columns are intact. Your hip may or may not be dislocated. You may have one big fragment or multiple small pieces and marginal impaction. On the right of the screen, we know what a transverse fracture is, where the fracture line goes through the anterior and the posterior column, but the ischiopubic fragment stays as one piece. So when you combine these two concepts, you have your transverse fracture going through both the columns and you have a posterior wall fracture. Why are these so important? They are more difficult to treat. And uh, if you look at the literature, their prognosis often is quite poor, even if you get accurate reduction. So the personality of the injury also dictates the prognosis, even in the hands of masters. It's also very important when you plan your exposure, whether you're going to do only a Cochalangenbeck approach from the posterior aspect, or whether you think an anterior and a posterior approach are going to be needed. So the first question that I tried to answer is whether a single posterior approach is enough, and in which cases you would do a sequential anterior and then a posterior approach. And we have seen um, the previous speakers deal with this. So if you look at the picture on the left, where you have the obliquity of the fracture line exiting quite high up anteriorly. So the fracture pattern is important. The direction of displacement, which is again predominantly anteriorly, and the degree of displacement. These are the cases where a sequential anterior and posterior approach is more likely to be needed to get an anatomic reduction. If you look at the picture on the right, which is usually an infratectal or a juxtatectal fracture, where the majority of the displacement is posterior, you'll probably not need a separate anterior approach. So this was described nicely in an approach-based algorithm that was given by Dr. Torneta in his paper. And he described how if your anterior displacement is more, more than one centimeter, and the fracture exiting higher in the anterior column, he would perform an ileo-inguinal approach first and then a Cockerlangenbach approach. And if these criteria were absent, then you could directly go for a cocker langen back. And these are images that um, I've taken from Dr. Torneta's paper. And I think we saw these images in one of the previous talks as well. And you can see how he nicely points out the exiting of the fracture much higher up anteriorly and the displacement of the anterior column fracture. And these were treated sequentially, first anteriorly and then posteriorly. And again, this image is from Dr. Torneta's paper. And you can see a good anatomic reduction using the sequential approach. Now, the types of the anterior approach that have been used by authors has changed historically. In the older series from Letourneil, majority of these were quite delayed. And some of the fractures he describes in his book were almost three months old, four months old. And that was the time when hip replacements were not widely practiced. So extended iliofemoral was common. And in his hands, it gave good results. And Mata also described the same. Torneta describes mainly the ileoinguinal approach. And I think in my hands, the workhorse still is ileoinguinal in the vast majority and the stopper approach in the remaining cases. The second question that I tried to answer is whether or not posterior fixation is enough for these cases or whether you need a separate anterior fixation or a dual fixation. And it's very difficult to find literature on this, there is a lot of concern that if you only stick with posterior fixation, you're going to get displacement and the reduction is going to be lost. So when I learned to do these fractures, I was always taught to use a double plate, which were over contoured from the posterior approach. The first plate is a smaller plate and fixes the column. And the second plate uh, buttresses the wall. 
and I have not yet seen in 15 years any case where I've lost the reduction later on. But if you want to fix the anterior uh, column as well, then an anterior column screw through a cockle angle approach is quite useful. Now the trajectory of the screw that is shown in this picture is very difficult to get through a cockle angle back unless you come separately percutaneously through the abductor mass. So often the trajectory of the screw, if you're going to use with a cockle angle back has to change and the entry point is shifted a bit more posteriorly in the retro acetabular area. This was a randomized study which looked at posterior only fixation or single column plating versus a double uh, column plating with a separate anterior column screw. It was a small study and only 15 patients in each group, but in the medium term, what they showed is that both the groups got similar functional outcomes, similar hospital stay, and no loss of reduction. But where they did use an anterior column screw that resulted in a significantly increased surgical time. So probably it is not required. And if you think it is required, then you can put a screw through the posterior column. So these are steps that we use if we are going to reduce a transverse with posterior wall only from a cockle Langenbeck approach. The principles are the same as you would do in a posterior wall, but there is the addition of the posterior column to reduce as well. So you would distract the joint to remove the debris and reduce the femoral head accurately. Then you would reduce the columns particularly the anterior column correctly. And for this, more often than not, it is the rotation that needs to be corrected. Assess the reduction with a finger on the quadrilateral plate. Deal with your marginal impaction and the wall piece. Fix it temporarily with K wires or with reduction forceps and then stabilize it. And in my hands, it's always almost universally uh, two plates from the posterior side if required with an anterior column screw. I do my cockle Langenbeck approach in the lateral position because I find that easier for orientation and it gives you the access to do a surgical dislocation as well, which I cannot do from the prone position. The hip is extended and the knee is flexed. And you can see in this case, how much trauma was caused to the sciatic nerve. Now, if you look at transverse with posterior wall fractures, Dr. Kretek has described that almost 9% of his cases of this type had a primary sciatic nerve injury, uh, even before the surgery happened. The reduction maneuvers we are all familiar with, either using a pelvic distractor or a lateral traction through the trochanter. And this is a very important maneuver to perform with a shan screw into the ischium, which allows you to really use the shan screw as a joystick and mobilize the posterior column, uh, derotate it, lift it up, lateralize it, medialize it, and help with the reduction. Then we use these standard reduction clamps or with two screws and a Faraboff clamp to try and reduce your posterior column accurately. If you over compress with a Faraboff posteriorly, often your anterior column will open up. So you have to be careful in these reduction maneuvers. And you can then assess the reduction using a finger through the greater sciatic notch. Uh, like Ashok, I don't think an ischial spine osteotomy is required in acute cases, but I'll show some delayed cases where it becomes the default option to derotate the posterior column. Another way to assess the reduction is fluoroscopically, getting your AP and Jude views uh, intraoperatively to make sure that both columns are accurately reduced. And then this was what I meant about the trajectory of the anterior column screw. So if you want to use it through a cockle angle back and not make a separate percutaneous opening uh, into the abductor muscle mass, then the entry point is shifted slightly posteriorly, uh, if you see it on the left side image, uh, the screw that goes through the pink shaded area is the trajectory for the anterior column screw through a cockle angle back approach. And the smaller screws of 3.5 millimeters may sometimes be needed, especially if your anterior column corridor is quite narrow. And this is the reduction of the marginal impaction. This was quite a comminuted marginal impaction, as you can see. The, the key is to make sure that the osteotome goes way posteriorly and you get a thick uh, cancellous bone mass that is still attached to the articular cartilage and then it is packed with bone from the greater trochanter. Once you have reduced your marginal impaction, the wall piece goes back and it can be held temporarily with K wires. Um, I like to use spring plates where there is a lot of comminution or interfragmentary screws if you get a single piece and then 
The first plate is a smaller plate on the posterior edge of the column, usually just anterior to the greater sciatic notch. And the second plate will then go on the wall. I tend to over contour my plates in transverse fractures so that the anterior column doesn't open up, especially if I'm not going to use a separate anterior column screw. So let's look at some cases. In this case, you can see that the posterior comminution was quite extensive and the anterior column fracture was relatively undisplaced. So the choice of approach would be to go from the posterior aspect to address the various different injuries that you encounter from the back. And in this case, a double plate with um, a spring plate was used. And that is the outcome at five years with good anatomic reduction and no sign of any AVN or arthritis. This was an interesting case. A young man in his 30s who was hit by a car, uh, he had this typical transverse with posterior wall fracture and the fracture line was exiting anteriorly. And my surgical plan was to use a sequential approach if required in this one, uh, based on these images and based on the CT scan. Unfortunately, he also had a very severe chest injury and a rupture of the thoracic aorta. He also had a lot of marginal impaction, which would have to be addressed in this case anteriorly. And there was also some posterior marginal impaction. So in both the sites, he would need elevation and bone grafting. But he remained very unstable despite uh, his cardiothoracic surgery. And in the end, it transpired that I could not operate on him at all, despite the fact that his posterior wall pieces were also significantly displaced. So looking at this uh, CT image, we can all assume that he's going to get quite a bad outcome and quite soon because I could not operate. So effectively, he was treated conservatively. And interestingly, this was the x-ray at three years, not too long ago. He has minimal pain. He is mobilizing quite well, a very tiny limp. The hip hasn't undergone any late subluxation, late dislocation, AVN. It's clearly arthritic but functionally he's doing really well. So sometimes we do tend to chase the x-ray too much. And you know we, we've all been taught that you need an accurate reduction on the x-ray to get a good outcome. And by and large, that is correct and we're trying to do it. But many times nature is much more forgiving, thankfully for the patient and for us. Another example of a slightly older age group patient, you can tell that from the quality of the bone, a transverse with posterior wall, this was also exiting high up anteriorly, but it was undisplaced. So there was no need for a sequential approach and it was also incomplete. So just a posterior approach with two plates and a reduction of the fracture. But this one also developed some progressive migration of the head, some avascular necrosis of the apex of the head and secondary arthritic changes at four years. Again, surprisingly, this lady is remarkably minimally symptomatic. So at this stage, I'm, I've not got any plans to do any further surgery. She's managing quite well. When we look at the evidence that is available for transverse with posterior wall, the vast majority of the historical papers report between 60 to 70% or around 80% of excellent reductions and good reductions. Except Tornetta's paper, where he described that surgical algorithm, and he describes a 100% excellent to good reduction. The limitation, of course, is that his reductions were assessed only on plain x-rays. And we know that as soon as we get CT scans, the so-called excellent reductions don't look so excellent anymore. The vast majority of these authors were able to deal with their transverse and posterior wall fractures in 80% of the cases using just a cocker Langenbach. But even with a perfect reduction, 15 to 20% got arthritis. If the reduction was not perfect, almost 75% got arthritis. Again, the anatomic reduction rate in Mata's paper was also 80%, but despite that, 30% had poor results. In Professor Kretek's paper, if um, you look at the whole group, 48% got arthritis, despite having a 90% anatomic reduction rate. And if you look at only the anatomic reconstructions, one fourth got arthritis at four to six years, despite very, very good reduction. So these are poor prognosis injuries and there is a risk of joint failure despite technical excellence. And if that is going to be the natural history of many of these fractures, you have to ask yourself how aggressive you want to be in the beginning itself. Whether you want to do two approaches 
extensive surgery on day one, but one fourth of them will get arthritis, but then that may potentially compromise your next operation. Or you might want to go a little bit less aggressive in these poor prognosis injuries and keep the territory intact as much as possible for secondary reconstruction as and when it is required. So these are difficult fractures to deal with, often with poorer outcomes. It is important to understand their displacement and fracture patterns. The vast majority can be treated with a cocker langenbach approach. Two approaches may be required depending on the anterior displacement, the obliquity, and whether there is an associated pelvic ring injury where you have to fix the symphysis or the sacroiliac joint. And arthritis and joint failure can happen even with satisfactory reduction. Now, if we have another two or three minutes, I'll show some late cases. It's not very common to get late presentations in a UK type of practice, but we do get a few of them. And in my hands, the vast majority of late cases will be treated with some form of joint replacement surgery. So this was an 81 year old with an irreducible transverse fracture with a posterior wall fracture who was referred to me around two and a half to three months. And the hip joint was still, you can see that it's still subluxed. When I went in, there was a clear transverse fracture that had not united. And the entire posterior wall piece was uh, non-functional. It was like a thin shell, which you can't really put back. So I've used a femoral head graft from the patient uh, to replace the posterior wall segment, uh, buttressed it under a plate that also helps to fix the non-union use impaction grafting of the rest of the fracture, and then you ream into it, and you sort of create a new acetabulum using her own femoral head. And again, I know that uh, some of you um, smile when I use a lot of cement, but I did use a cemented hip in her, and she is now coming on to almost five years, so around 86, 87 years old, this lady now. She's doing really well, even with cemented reconstructions. This was a patient that had uh, a transverse with posterior wall fracture. She had this kind of a fixation done elsewhere. Uh, it doesn't matter where it was done. When she came to us, she had multiple other fractures with head injuries, a liver and a spleen injury, uh, infected wounds on her leg. So it was quite difficult to um, operate until all these were sorted out. So I could only go in really at four months. This was the CT scan, which shows the extensive comminution. And by the time you go in at four months, in the vast majority of these cases, the head is damaged as well. Now her posterior wall fracture was comminuted and there was no soft tissue attachment left at all. So I did an in vitro fixation of the pieces that I could salvage and uh, put this back into the hip joint and then fixed it with some columns. Now these are the cases where I feel that the infection rate can be quite high if you attempt to do too much at one go. So my philosophy for these uh, cases is to do a two-stage reconstruction. So in the first stage, I fixed the columns. There was need for an ischial spine osteotomy to derotate the ischial uh, pubic fragment. And I left it alone as a girdle stone, as a pseudo, with lots and lots of bone graft, as you can see. It heals beautifully. And about three to four months later, you can go in. And I did a second stage total hip replacement. And she's also coming to around five years. No complications no infection, and good function of the sciatic nerve. This fracture was underestimated in another unit, and it was treated uh, non-surgically. There was no other um, imaging that was studied, but there was clearly subluxation of the femoral head, and um, she got quite a bad outcome with conservative treatment, with a lot of pain and a lot of symptoms. So similar reconstruction, the posterior wall that was um, a shell was uh, replaced with a head graft, and a hip reconstruction with good outcomes in the long term. So those are the three late cases. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mehul, for your uh, excellent uh, talk. And now I invite Dr. Mehul. Dr. Mehul also is from UK. And Dr. Mehul is going to talk about uh, transfer fractures associated with pelvic injuries. Dr. Mehul, can you please share your screen? Is that good? Can you can you see me? Yeah, we can see you and we can hear you. Now, will you sh share your screen? Yeah, 
there is a share screen option yeah it won't let me share it for some reason i have unshared uh, mehul so you should be able to share uh just uh, press the green uh, green yeah. button in the center hello ha pradeep yes my on we can see yes we can see you okay well and you can hear me as well perfect so thank you very much for the invitation you know it's a um it's a great honor to be here uh, amongst all of you um to 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 run the second of the webinar series and we've had some fantastic talks already and you can just appreciate how much discussion there's going to be around this particular fracture type so what i'm going to do is spend the next 10 12 minutes just talking a little bit about the transverse fractures and the transverse family of fractures and look at them in association with a pelvic ring injury um when we look at any fracture it's really important to understand what we're trying to achieve um understand what our goals are and what we're trying to avoid so we're trying to get an anatomical reduction we're trying to achieve a stable hip we're trying to provide longevity of the hip joint okay what we're trying to avoid is complication so mal reductions mal positioning of implants um and um and and therefore leading to um complications such as avn or arthritis so what we'll do is talk a little bit about how we achieve this and i thought i'd start with a case uh, and then run on further from that so it's a it's a it's a case that stays in my mind quite vividly so she's a 20 20 year old female she fell from a fourth floor height admitted to to one of the other trauma centers in the uk she had a combined pelvic and acetabular fracture she had a complex midfoot injury to the left foot as well a few facial injuries and a few other injuries as well so i'm just going to run through her a ct we managed to get her ct from the the hospital that she presented to so i'm just going to run through that i've only managed to get a, a coronal ct so just running through that and i'll stop it in certain places oops i'll stop it in certain places just so you can appreciate the injuries so there we go we see that the whole of the hip joint has dislocated medially we see that there's femoral head injury and as we run through towards the back you can see the displacement in the posterior column the opening of the sacroiliac joint and if we run right through the back we see that there's a um a crescent type fracture so a posterior ilium fracture there on the left as well so she comes to us at 3 weeks for rehabilitation she's been fixed in that unit okay and this is how she's been fixed so she's had fixation of the right posterior pelvic ring the left posterior pelvic ring and she's had a sequential staged approach so initially they went in anterior and put an anterior plate and then they went in posteriorly and put in two posterior plates as well these are her jude views and so you can appreciate that the hip joint is not reduced there's marked displacement of the uh, acetabulum and also subluxation of the femoral head this is her ct her post op ct that she had in her initial unit and we'll just run back and run through that once more so you see the degree of displacement there 
and the gapping. And you see the amount of heterotopic bone and callus that's being starting to form. Okay, so what do you do now? That's the question, isn't it? She's 20 years old. She has had a major operation or two major operations already. She's three weeks down the line and she's come to your unit for rehabilitation, okay? So take a step back, let's establish the injury pattern. So she's got a, an LC3 pelvic ring injury with a left-sided crescent and a right-sided widening of the SI joint. That's what we've been told. She's got a transtectal transverse fracture. She's got bilateral superior and inferior pubic rami fractures. Her original wounds were um, an anterior wound through an ilioinguinal and a posterior wound. And so that's where we are, 23 days post-surgery. And these were my thoughts. Um, I offered her um, revision surgery and revision reconstruction. And the way I was thinking about it is in three stages. So thinking of back, gaining access to the back of the acetabulum, um, coming in from the front and then going back to the posterior surface again. I was planning to start off prone to remove the left-sided metalwork, mobilize the fracture, clear out any callus, and then to put her into the supine position to remove the, um, the anterior plate, again, mobilize the fracture, then reduce and fix the fracture from the front and then turn her back into the, uh, the lateral or the semi-prone position uh, to fix the posterior element of the fracture. So here we go, so in, some intraoperative images. So I've cleared um, uh, the posterior elements of the fracture and removed the metalwork posteriorly. And then the top left image shows the, the two um, plates through the lateral window and a couple of um, um, iliosacral screws, both in S1 and S2. And once I've tackled that, I then uh, pay attention to the acetabular fracture. Um, again, using offset clamp, clamps, I've managed to secure um, part of the anterior wall of the fracture with a spring plate and then a, uh, a, a column plate. And then I've used a separate infrapectineal plate as well to secure the infrapectineal surface of that fracture. So that's what we have from the anterior approach. And then um, I close up and flip her into the semi-prone position. And again, a separate plate for the posterior column element. So that's there, that's her there now, uh, post-operatively, two days post-op. So it's really important to understand these injuries. And we've heard a lot about the anatomy of this fracture. We've heard a lot about the displacement of the fracture. When you start putting these two injuries together, so a transverse family fracture type with a pelvic and acetabular injury, it's important to realize this is an uncommon injury. And if you look at various series, um, uh, there are percentages from between five and percent, uh, five and fifteen percent of all pelvic ring disruptions have an acetabular fracture. Nine percent of all acetabular fractures are thought to have a pelvic ring injury. And then if you look at uh, a couple of other papers, so the Letanel's paper in 93, they showed a 16.1% rate of combined pelvic and acetabular fractures. It's important to understand that these are different to the isolated injuries. They are high energy injuries. These patients have a higher injury severity score. They require more blood and the mortality rates for the more severe injuries are significantly higher. There are specific pattern types that occur more commonly with the combined approach. So if you're looking at the pelvic ring, the injury patterns that tend to occur more and more are the lateral compression type injuries and the AP compression. So the APCs and the lateral compressions. If we look at which acetabular fractures are associated with pelvic ring injuries, the transverse family group and the associated both column fractures are commonly associated with pelvic ring injuries. This was an interesting article. So um, a few years ago, um, this group, Selec et al, looked at just transverse and transverse family fractures. 
and they looked at the posterior pelvic ring injury associated with these fractures. They had 51 transverse or transverse family type fractures. Two thirds of these patients had a posterior pelvic ring injury. And in the majority of these cases, it was sacroiliac joint dislocation. The sacroiliac joint dislocation was ipsilateral in about half of the cases. In about a third, it was on the contralateral side. And in just under 10%, it was bilateral. And what they did is they looked at their groups of patients. They looked at the amount of displacement of the posterior pelvic ring. Okay. And then they looked at their anatomical reduction of the acetabulum. And what they found is that if there is a, a greater displacement of the posterior pelvic ring, this decreased their chances of getting an anatomical reduction. So turning that on its head, you need to have an anatomical reduction of the posterior pelvis if you want to try and achieve an anatomical reduction of the acetabulum in most cases. So, you know, what do I, what do I think about? What's my decision-making process? What's my decision-making algorithm when I look at these combined injuries? And for me, I think there are four subtypes, okay? I think there are those um, combined injuries, both which can be treated non-operatively, okay? So this would, this would be a, a lateral compression type one pelvic ring injury with a possibly a uh, an infratectal transverse fracture or an infratectal T fracture, okay, with a roof arc angle of more than 45 degrees, all of that could be treated non-operatively. You have subtype number two, where you have combined injuries where either one or the other need fixation. So you may have an LC3 injury, you may have an APC type two pelvic ring injury that needs fixation, but the acetabular fracture on its own merit doesn't require fixation. Or vice versa, you may have um, a, a type one lateral compression type injury or an APC1 injury, but you may have a displaced acetabular fracture, which again would require surgery. So only one out of the two injuries requires fixation. And these make up about 75% of these combined injuries. And then you move on to subtypes three and four. So this, this group of patients make up the other 25%. And in this group, I tend to divide them into two, two different categories. There are those which I term subtype three, and these are combined injuries where, where there's a requirement for emergency management and stabilization of the pelvic ring. Okay, it's life-threatening, limb-threatening, you need to stabilize the pelvic ring. So you do that, and then you come back and fix the, uh, the acetabular fracture. And then you have subtype four, where you have a combination of injuries, both that require fixation, but you can do everything in one go, okay? They are not hemodynamically compromised. When you look at the emergency management group, so subtype three, which I've called, um, these can either be dealt with in two ways. So you can either perform temporary fixation of the pelvic ring by means of an external fixator, anti-shock screws if the patient is an extremist, an infix, you can put in pins, traction pins, et cetera, whatever you can to try and stabilize that patient, get them back to the ITU, okay? Or you can perform definitive stabilization of the pelvic ring. And when I think about these combined injuries and, and definitive stabilization of the pelvic ring, I'm keen to stabilize the back and get that anatomically reduced. And then regarding the front, I want to leave, leave some degree of flex so that I'm not compromising my reduction of the transverse or the transverse family type of acetabular fracture. So I'll either use an inter infix, okay, or I'll use a, a small plate um, which I may change when I go back for definitive fixation of the acetabulum. So this is an example of that. This is case number two, a 56 year old male, um, a, a high speed collision, 120 miles an hour. He's got all of these injuries. He's got lots and lots of injuries. Of note, he's got a right open femoral fracture, a right open um, pilon fracture, 
Um, he's got a combined pelvic ring and an acetabular fracture. So he's got a left-sided sacral fracture, bilateral superior and inferior pubic rami fractures, and uh, um, a right acetabular fracture. So this guy's hemodynamically unstable. He's got lots going on, okay? Um, he's had his PAC A and PAC B, so he's had major massive transfusion and is still hypotensive. So he needs something as an emergency procedure. You can see and appreciate his left uh, sacral fracture, which is displaced, and the disruption at the front and the right acetabulum. This is his uh, CT scan. So we'll just run through that. It's almost a T-type fracture or an incomplete T, but you see the injury. So in this particular case, I fix his uh, femoral fracture, um, close the wounds, X fixes uh, open pilon fracture um, after I've fixed, temporarily fixed his pelvis. So he has a temporization, fixation of his pelvis, um, where I fix the, uh, the back with the two screws and I fix the front with an infix. And then I take him back to the unit and I, I come back in a, in a few days time, four days time, to come back and fix his right acetabulum. Moving on to the type four. So this is where both injuries require fixation, but you can fix everything all in one go, okay? And in these type of cases, I think it's really important to think about how you're gonna tackle, which bits you're gonna tackle and the order. So decision-making now involves order of fixation, what you're going to fix and when, the approach or approaches. Can you do this all through one approach or, you, or are you gonna to have to do more than one approach? And then thinking about positioning, what's gonna be the optimum position so that you can complement your approach and your fixation. So I'll try and illustrate this through another case, through the last case. So this is a 32 year old male, a motorcyclist again hit by a car. So he's got a right uh, pelvic and acetabular fracture, a displaced transverse fracture of the right acetabulum. He's got symphysis diastasis and he's got uh, some opening of the uh, right SI joint. He's also got a grade three uh, open tibial fracture on the right side with segmental bone loss. So he goes to have his um, uh, tibia debrided, etc., cetera, and X fixed. And then he ends up with a, an above knee amputation actually, sorry, below knee amputation. So this is his initial x-ray and you look at this x-ray and to those of you that um, um, can see there's a there's that notch fragment um, which really worries me. So on its own his pelvic shape doesn't look that bad but you can see that he has quite a displaced uh, transverse fracture of the right acetabulum. If you look at the front of his symphysis so the front of the pelvis you can see something isn't quite right and there is an incongruity there. And those of you, if you look at his right SI joint, maybe there's a bit of opening there. So when I see that notch fragment and the amount of displacement there, that concerns me. So I'll show you his CT now. This is his CT and we'll just run through that. And it was pretty quick. So we're just gonna run through it again. But what, I'll, what I would like you to do is to look at the front of the pelvis as well. So essentially there, he looks as if he's got a locked symphysis. So what we saw on that plain X-ray was different to this. Um, this shows that there's overlap and a significant um, injury to that symphysis. And then look at that notch fragment as we go around. See the displacement, see the rotation. Okay, so when I'm thinking about this, this is my approach to management of this case. So again, thinking about things that we've already talked about, order of fixation, thinking about approaches and thinking about positioning. So order of fixation, um, when I'm looking at this, I want to tackle this all in one go. I want to ensure that I've got an intact posterior pelvic ring. So that's where I'm gonna start. And then I'm gonna work forward, okay? So posterior pelvis, the acetabulum, and then work anterior. My approach is um, either a percutaneous or an open approach to the SI joint. There wasn't marked displacement of the SI joint, so I'm, I'm hopeful that I can get this percutaneously. And then I'm thinking about the, the acetabular fracture and I'm thinking I may 
well have to do a dual approach for this with a degree of displacement. And with this particular fracture, I want to go posterior first. And the thing that tells me to go or, or warns me about going posterior first is that notch fragment, which I want to try and reduce and take the pressure of the uh, um, superior gluteal neurovascular bundle. And then I'm gonna be um, following that uh, with an anterior type approach. Positioning for this particular case, I'm gonna start off prone, okay? Which I usually don't do, but in the prone position, I know that I can get my um, uh, uh, SI screw and I can perform a Cochlear back as well. And then I'm gonna turn the patient supine. So this is just talking through that case, lots of images. So if again, if we start at the top uh, left-hand corner, that's the aliosacral screw um, securing the SI joint. And then a Cochlear-Langenbeck approach in the, in, the, in the prone position. And you can see the various clamps and things that we've talked about. So in the middle image, top line, you can see the Jungbluth clamp gaining that reduction of that posterior column, okay? If you look at the image on the top row on the right, you see that there's a, um, a, a shant pin into the femoral head to again, allow that lateral traction so that you can fine tune your reduction and maintain your reduction. And then my, um, my uh, isolated screw into that notch fragment and then a column plate with only two screws either side, two screws proximally and two screws distally. And those are my Jude views showing the reduction. I then change position. So I stitch up the patient and put them into the supine position. Um, and I typically do uh, um, an AIP uh, and uh, a lateral or a middle window. With this particular case, um, it was a, a, a lateral and a middle window. And you see here, I've um, uh, got an anterior plate, just a short anterior plate for the anterior column element of the fracture. And I've secured that. And then a, a subsequent four hole symphysial plate to secure the symphysis. And this is the patient post-op. This is a CT post-op. Sacroiliac joint looks good with the screw. Just going to stop at the dome level, and that looks pretty good. So, in summary, you know these these combined injuries are uncommon. They are complex injuries, and they can be underappreciated because we have binders which might mask things or you may not appreciate your focus may be on that transverse fracture and you may miss a subtle SI joint or a subtle symphysial injury, okay? There are common injury patterns. So if you've got a combined injury, if it's the pelvic side of it, it's gonna be a lateral compression or an APC type injury. The acetabular fractures that are associated with these pelvic ring injuries are either the transverse family group or the associated both columns. Think of that posterior pelvic ring injury, okay? And think about reducing that anatomically, okay? Identify all aspects of your injury. And then more specific management um, uh, summary is think of the four subtypes. So there'll be a group of patients in whom both injuries can be managed non-operatively. There'll be a group of patients whom in only one of the two, either the pelvis or the acetabulum needs to be fixed. And then you have the 25% of patients where both injuries need to be fixed. And then if you look at that group of patients, you can further subdivide them into those that require emergency management of the pelvis and then subsequent management of their uh, acetabular fracture and those in whom you can tackle everything together. When you think about these injuries, just like with any other injury, think about what needs to be fixed, the order of fixation, the approach and positioning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mehul. It was very nice detailed description of the combined pelvis tabular injuries. And uh, now we move on to the question and answer session. So 
now if we can have uh, everyone start their audio and video both so this question is for dr nikhil shah uh, there is a question that uh, when you are doing a second i mean when you are doing a sequential uh, uh, treatment for the delayed cases where you have uh, shown one case where you have gone and done a plate with head graft and then you have done a thr so is plate always necessary that was the question is it always necessary to have plate posteriorly in delayed cases and i want dr nikhil shah to answer it if you remember the x rays and the scans that i showed it was a widely displaced uh, transverse fracture which was four months old so it was basically a non union so in order to reduce that properly and to fix it to get it to heal you do need a plate what i am trying to do is um, uncouple two major problems and solve one problem at a time in the first surgery you solve the problem of a widely displaced ununited transverse fracture which has been previously operated upon in a patient who is not very well and has other injuries and recently recovered infections you get it to heal and in the second um time you solve the problem of giving her a pain free functioning hip to walk on and i've done i've used this uh, two stage philosophy from 2006 and it began in my work uh, in pelvic discontinuity and i've got over 70 patients now of various different types which i've treated in two stages and i think you know sometimes you just need to give nature a chance to heal in the second case i used a plate because again it was an ununited fracture and the head graft was located quite posteriorly if the head graft is located only superiorly like you do in your ddh cases then you don't need a plate but if the head graft is posteriorly located there is a lot of shear force and then i like to use a plate uh, to support that yes dr mehul you are going to say something Yeah, I was just going to add add to that. Um, so when I I deal with a lot of discontinuities as well, and that's exactly what I do. I prefer to use the host bone, whatever's there, and try and bring that together. Although there there is a different philosophy uh, in some other centres and some other revision hip surgeons. So you don't always have to use a plate. Um, you can use other other means of fixation. So you can use a cage. um secure the cage inferiorly secure the cage posteriorly and then you don't have to put a posterior column plate but i agree with nicky what i prefer is to use the 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 host bone and to compress that and i think once you compress and you load that bone i think you're likely to get it to heal okay right now i have prepared one or two case scenarios for all of you so i will just share with you those okay you can see yep everybody yes okay yeah i think now we can see it yes everybody can see it yep so this is the patient she is a female 20 years old a dental student and she met with a road traffic accident her vitals were stable no wounds and this is the x ray so the first question is whether it is a pelvic fracture whether it is a cerebellum fracture or whether it is a combined fracture on the x ray Yes, uh, can we start with Doctor Nikhil? Uh, given the high energy type of injury and the left sacroiliac joint also looks uh, a bit wide, uh, there seems to be a fracture going through the conjoint ramus as well, inferiorly. So I would have a low threshold of thinking this is something more than an acetabulum fracture and get additional imaging. Okay, so we do have additional imaging. Is it? Is it? Mehul, what do you read from it? Uh, 
it's uh, one of your compact tail wheel stabilizer injuries. Sorry, the, the question was, do I think this is a combined injury? Is that right? Yes, yes. Ah, yeah, so again, I, I was more convinced uh, about it being a combined type of injury when I, oh, okay, here we go. So again, I can't see the SI joints on the axials um, or the coronals, but looking at the plain film, I was suspicious that this is a, a combined injury with um, some opening of the left sacroiliac joint and some incongruity of the uh, symphysis. Now it's important um, that you appreciate when you saw that initial AP X-ray, the femoral head. Had, had dislocated medially and was therefore impinging on the rest of the intact ileum. And when it does that, what it does to the ileum is it forces it open and it gives you uh, um, uh, a, 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 a thought process that the, the SI joint may be open, but it may just be the fact that the hip is dislocated and you've got that head impinging and externally rotating that intact fragment. So you've got to be careful. Yes. Anybody else wants to add anything to it? Yeah, so the point that uh, uh, Mez made, it is beautifully described by Letournel as well. Yes. Because we all fo focus on the deformity of the lower fragment, the ischio pubic fragment. But what Letournel also describes that when your ischio pubic fragment rotates around its horizontal axis and its vertical axis, the upper fragment or the iliac fragment also rotates externally and superiorly. And that causes widening of the inferior sacroiliac joint. But Letournel accepts in his book that even they were not sure in many cases whether the deformity of the sacroiliac joint was because of the fragment moving or whether there was genuinely a partial injury to the anterior sacroiliac yes, joint. So I think yes. if you have to if you have to err on one side, it is probably better to err on the side of assuming the worst and working backwards, proving that it's not injured, than to assume it's not injured and find out a problem later on. Okay. So now uh, again, question to Dr. Mehul because you were uh, describing the combined injuries. What would be a primary treatment in your case in this patient? Would you is this in that 25% cases where the uh, pelvis and acetabulum both need to be addressed? Yeah, a, a good question. And with this particular case, I, I would go in thinking that both need to be addressed or be prepared, be prepared to address both. I think from, from looking at these x-rays, I think it's, it's probably only the acetabulum that needs addressing. But the problem here is going to be the chronicity. So once you have fragments or part of the pelvis held in a certain position, you may not be able to reduce them. Okay. And so even though we think the SI joint might be a secondary feature of the actual acetabular fracture, once you go in there, you may well find that actually it's, it's quite mobile and you may need to free it up to get it closed again. If you get these injuries early and you put the hip back under the, under the acetabular, then you, the SI joint may well close. But in this chronic situation, it may not close. And so you may have to clear yeah, it out is, and, and think about fixing this is it. Immediate, this is immediately on the same day of injury. Oh, not, okay, this is on the same day. Okay, fine. So if it's on the same day, then I would fix um, the acetabular fracture. As I'm fixing the acetabular fracture, I would assess the, the pelvic ring also. Okay. But you don't think that this is a patient which requires a staged pelvis fixation first and then subsequently an acetabulum? Definitely not. Definitely not. Okay. So this patient was in one of the uh, cities uh, away from my hospital and this is the primary treatment done over there. Your comments, uh, first uh, Dr. Mehul and then we'll have somebody from
Yeah, so again, you can see what they've tried to do. They've tried to apply some lateral traction to try and bring that head out. Um, I wonder whether they've tried to uh, attach that lateral traction to the external fixator. I don't think the external fixator is doing anything, the, the, the crest pins. Um, but it, the only thing it may well be doing is if it's attached to the lateral traction somehow, that might be helpful. No, it's not attached to the lateral traction. No. The then patient I don't think... has a lateral traction and a supracondylar femoral traction. Yeah, then I, I don't think the um, external fixator in the crest is doing anything at all. I think they haven't managed to get yes, the head. Yes, Dr. Srinivas. Into... Yeah. So I do accept because it, the external fixator at this point of time doesn't have any role. Because your SA giant seems to be reasonably okay. And uh, the main problem is at the acetabulum. And I'm sure this uh, pin won't work. Yes. So <clears throat> now that this thing has been done, uh, Dr. Nikhil, do you think that it has in any way jeopardized the future treatment? Well, I think uh, Mez published a beautiful paper a few years ago with Tony Ward about infection after external fixation. And in our unit, uh, our results were very similar. Whenever we get an external fixator from some other unit, 50 to 60% of them unfortunately have got infection. And that really compromises the planning, the exposure, the risk of infection. And you know, I would rather that if a unit is going to refer patients to me, they call me up in the middle of the night on the first day and discuss with me first, then do something and call me later. Yes, Dr. Mayor, can you put more details into it? Yeah, I think Your paper. In, in, yeah, in the current situation, I, I agree with Nikhil. I think um, trying to go in and do everything in, in one sitting when you've got an external fixator that you don't know where it's been put in, how it's been put in, how long it's been there for, I think you're, you're jeopardizing treatment and you may end up with infection. So my particular approach for this case would be um, to perform, uh, to remove the external fixator, debride the wounds. But as I'm doing that, I would do my stage one of my long-term management plan. And that stage one for me would be clearing out the fracture site, mobilizing the fracture from um, the anterior approach and then closing everything up. And then what I'd probably do is do a subsequent um, a posterior approach and try and fix everything through the posterior approach. The, the only additional so, thing Mike. I would add is um, when you have so much displacement medially, um, I would probably have a low threshold of repeating a contrast CT or a CT angiogram once she comes to our unit. Because that might tell me if I have to prepare for some you know, unexpected problems. Related to vascularity, I mean bleeding. Yeah. Bleeding. Okay, now uh, Dr. Mehul, I'm still with you. If you yeah. want to do an anterior, you said you debride and go anteriorly to clear up the fracture and probably get the head reduced beneath the dome. So what approach you will be taking in that case? Yeah, so I'd be, I'd be using a, um, an AIP, so uh, a modified stopper and uh, a lateral window. Um, I may think about using a window two if I have to, and certainly if there are uh, any issues with the, with the vascular side of things, I would want window two open, but I would certainly use an AIP and a lateral window. And what I want to do is to come in from the top of that fracture and clear everything out. And I want to come in from medial to lateral to try and push the femoral head back and try and get a better reduction than that. Again, using the lateral window would give me access to the SI joint. So I'd be able to see that, visualize that, and know whether I need to think about treating that as well. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ashok, if you have to go through the same incision as the uh, pin tracks are, and the pin tracks are here for say eight days, would you be comfortable going in the same way like Dr. Mehul has suggested? Do we have Dr. Ashok here? 
Yeah. Yes, Dr. Ashok. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I think that that is a concern, but like if I need to go, like I would probably uh, go ahead and debride that entirely, sort of like uh, completely uh, clean it up and then proceed uh, if I have to, because like if that is an approach I have to take, I think like I'll go ahead with it. Eight days is pretty okay, like I, but it has to be debrided completely. So you may uh, go ahead, bride it, and then extend that incision further down and go to the fracture site. That's what you say. Yes. Okay. Now, this is how the fixator was done. So on the right side, it was a full long. Uh, I think that image has not yet loaded. Can everybody see the fixator pins? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, yeah, I can see that, but not your voice is not clear. Okay, this is what was done in form of fixator. It was not a percutaneous; it was an open incision and fixator. Does this change the plan? Yes, Doctor Ashok. Now, will you still go ahead and do the debridement the same way? I think I need a lateral window for this one to approach it anteriorly, definitely. So like uh, if these fall into my area of concern, I'll definitely go ahead and include that in my incision and debride them deeply. Okay, Dr. Krishna Kiran, yep. you spoke about all posterior. So do you think that we'll be able to address this fracture by all posterior approach and we may just avoid going through these trouble areas? So this is difficult because the, the extent of medial displacement and the anterior obliquity is quite high. So it may require a sequential approach. So I would probably think of a posterior combined with an anterior approach. But I would definitely not be comfortable operating in one uh, stage at seven, eight days with these pins in. So I would probably remove the pins and go the way Dr. Mehul has described, probably mobilize the fracture from the front, disimpact it and try to get it under the dome rather than you know the medial uh, thing and then uh, do it at a later date once the wound is come back. Any different thoughts from any of the faculty? Pranav, Pranav I have a question to Megal. Yes. Pranav? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, Mayul, a uh, question like uh, you said an AIP with a lateral window. Uh, how comfortable is to get into through the AIP in a delayed stage, like say like two weeks, three weeks? Yeah. So, so doing an AIP at three weeks, is that what you mean? Yeah. 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 I think what we've found, we've done a few delayed cases, and in all the delayed cases, through an AIP, everything, the vessels are stuck. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you're doing it delayed, definitely all of them need a CT angio. And we have, uh, um, I ring one of my vascular guys to make sure that he's around. Uh, because, you know, doing these delayed, going through the AIP, you think you're staying underneath the vessels, but everything is friable, everything is stuck. And just trying to even lift off subperiosteally, you can damage, damage the iliac. So yeah, it's a, it's a real problem. <laughs> Okay, so we move forward. This was a situation and the patient had lateral traction. I wanted to avoid going through any of these areas. So I went only posteriorly. Uh, even the cockle angle approach, I modified it a little and made it more posterior to avoid the pin tract of the lateral traction. The operative peaks, you can see this, uh, yeah, Get production. And plate. Not seeing, not seeing it. Yes. They're not able not to see it. the, no, no. Are you able to see it now? Yeah, yeah, now better, yeah. Are you able yeah. to see it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this is the provisional fixation with K wires. You see one K wire in your uh, HM area, which is helping me to derotate and uh, the provisional fixation. Then I put a couple of interfragmentary screws 
talking that now you can see that can image yeah you stuck with my internet connection is really poor yeah very difficult to hear yeah. actually we are stuck with the previous image we can't progress now you can't see uh, the screws for now one question mm -hmm. when you say you yes. avoided when you say you avoided the pin track of lateral traction do you mean you included mm -hmm. that in your incision and excised it or you went separately away from it went separately away from it it was not possible to include it with slightly curving the incision and completely excise it yeah it could have been done it was not frankly infected but i wanted to be just sure because i have burnt my fingers with these uh, pin tracks in the past so now you can see the image yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so two interfragmentary screws and then subsequently two plate fixation and it was quite stable so that was just i wanted to highlight that uh, even in combined pelvic acetabular injuries you have to prioritize what we should treat first exactly what dr mehul has suggested this case illustrates it very well yeah good now this is the second case i am just filling you with the details so long as the image gets loaded he Uh, with head injury and diffuse axonal injury, altered sensorium has been on ventilator for about two weeks, and thereafter, uh, at around four weeks' time, the neurosurgeon gives a clearance for surgery, but he says DVT prophylaxis has to go on. So this is the X-ray of that patient, and there is also a CT scan. the image will load in a few seconds but on the x ray one of you can start describing what you see and what you uh, i mean what are what are the thoughts going on in your mind yes anybody let's start with dr nikhil so on the x ray you see a displaced um, transverse fracture it appears to be juxta tectal the femoral head is migrated medially and uh, anteriorly and this is one of the signs that again letourneau pointed out in his book when one iliac wing looks bigger and broader than the other iliac wing on the other side with a widening of the sacroiliac joint so again it could be because of the deformity from the femoral head or it could be because there is a separate injury to the left sacroiliac joint in this case also i would have a low threshold of uh, getting a contrast ct or ct angio okay okay so the patient underwent ct angio with abdomen and contrast and it was uh, like uneventful except for the fracture nothing was abnormal and now we have this case at 4 weeks and we are operating it so i want you to each of you to come up with this or treatment plan what is your thought process what are the steps what is the approach and what are the precautions that you want to uh, take uh, let's start with dr nikhil first because your internet connection is best probably can you go back uh, one slide can you go back one slide Yeah, I have already, but it is going to take time to load because our gun is quite slow. So, looking at the CT scans, can I you feel, see it now? Yeah, I can see it now. You can you can go ahead now. Yeah. Okay. So, I think for this one, I would probably want to plan a sequential approach. Uh, go anterior first. and even if your ct angio is normal uh, the displacement of the fragment is quite a lot and in many of these cases at 4 weeks um, your blood vessels are quite stuck down so the mere uh, act of mobilizing the fragment and and trying to move it also can result in aversion injury so i want my vascular surgeon to be on standby preferably in the theater in the same premises and not in any other hospital um go anterior first mobilize the fracture or uh, reduce it anteriorly um try and get as good a reduction as possible anteriorly uh, 
check it under fluoroscopy and then perform a fixation anteriorly, but not um, too rigid a fixation. Leave it sufficiently loose so that if required, a second posterior approach can be done. And depending on how the first stage goes, um, either in the first sitting or um, come back another day for a second sitting. Dr. Mehul. Yeah, again. Uh, what releases you will anticipate? What releases to get this reduction? Yeah, very, very good question. So, so from my point of view, you can see on the CT scans, there's a lot of callus already. Oh, we've lost your screen share. But there's a lot of callus already um, that you can see in the fracture site. So I, again, would do a sequential approach. I think, you know, this is, this is one of those delayed fractures which, we'd, which would be amenable to the extended iliofemoral approach. But my concern there is that um, looking at the displacement uh, of that fracture, I'm concerned that there'll be tenting of the superior gluteal neurovascular bundle. And hence, um, that whole approach relies on that um, uh, neurovascular bundle to be intact. And I think if there's any question of that, then you're likely that things will fail with regards to soft tissue. So I would do a sequential approach. Again, I would start anteriorly. Um, I would, again, do an AIP um, and a middle and a lateral window. I think you've got to clear it out completely from the top if you can. And then what I'd try and do is to try and achieve a slightly better reduction than we already have here. I think I would go planning in to do a second approach. I think I'm not gonna get this all through one approach. There'll be callus posteriorly as well. And so I'd go posteriorly after clearing out anteriorly, clearing all the callus once more, seeing what type of reduction I get. If I can get a satisfactory reduction just through two approaches, anterior first and then posterior, then I'd be able to fix it. If I couldn't get a satisfactory reduction, then I'd probably have to go back to the front again after achieving stabilization of the posterior column. Now, if you look on the top left-hand corner, you can already see that there looks to be an avulsion um, at the level of the ischial spine. So I wonder whether some, I wonder whether something has already come off here, and you might be able to use that to your advantage without having to do any further release there. I think you're going to if, if that was intact, you would definitely have to either take um, the ligament off or perform a little osteotomy there to try and derotate that back. But I think for me, it would be either front back two approaches or front back front, depending okay. on the reduction. Yes, Dr. Gavaskar. Uh, I, I think I'll be uh, uh, sort of like following the same uh, principles, like uh, anterior first. I'll be using an ilioinguinal with an extended medial window. But like, uh, as uh, already discussed, like I'm not sure about what, where, where I will end up in the first stage. So very, that's very, very unlikely that I'm going to put some fixation in the first stage itself. Very unlikely, especially Great. for my aim is to sort of like uh, preserve the. So in that case, like I have to do a secondary uh, posterior, preferably in lateral position, and I might be open to a surgical dislocation as well in these cases to sort of uh, get the reduction at the level of the joint, clear the joint surfaces from inside, and then try derotating it. And if I can get a, get the femoral head under the dome, get everything in place, then I might again go anteriorly after posterior fixation to stabilize it. If I can't get the head under the dome and sort of like, I need to probably keep a replacement option in mind as well. How old okay. is your patient? Yep. This patient is around 35 years. Okay, so I think uh, to summarize what everybody should take home from this case is that these are very difficult cases to treat, number one. They may require extensile or sequential approaches, number two. And total hip replacement may be the only answer at the end of everything, number three. And four, 
be prepared for a lot of bleeding and have a vascular surgeon along with you when you are going anterior in this patient right have i summarized everybody yeah, yeah. One, one one question to nikhil yes please uh, nikhil like uh, since like uh, we are not sure about uh, whether the si injury is real uh, is there a place for some stress testing or something during uh, when you do the surgery yeah i think um, when you open your first window you can actually inspect the si joint and you can see if the anterior ligaments are frankly torn and uh, once you have got your anterior column reduced you can stress test um, on the table and while you are there it's not too difficult to put uh, a single si screw the reason i ask the age is um, i don't know with age i have probably i've become a little bit more conservative nowadays in how aggressively i want to go front back front and get the minutest of millimeters of reduction because any surgery that is very very extensive has got a very significant described comorbidity infection heterotopic ossification and yes. if the femoral head is already damaged at 4 weeks i'm not sure that i'm going to waste a full days operating to try and get every microscopic reduction perfect i'll get the acetabulum to generally look like an acetabulum and if i can get all of that from a single approach or maybe a second approach i'll probably stop at that not aim for perfection and come back another day to do a total hip you know the 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 results of total hip replacements in um, well performed acetabular surgery without infection and without ho in our hands at least are very reliable and they are very very predictable uh, yes, i agree uh, perfectly with nikhil actually like uh, if i can't get the head under the dome then yes definitely a hip is a way to go yeah so that brings us to three very important points again the outcomes of these neglected cases so in case we have uh, as an outcome a site injury which has not healed well or which is not going to heal well a heterotopic ossification or an infection then probably we have done worse than just leaving him alone absolutely so we have to always keep that in mind when we are treating this absolutely yes so now that brings us to the last part of the session uh, three questions only and then we'll uh, call it off first thing is how often do we have to do a safe surgical dislocation in these transverse fractures in your practice each and every faculty answer one by one just to see the reduction how often you have to do a ssd so let's start with dr ashok my indications for an ssd in a transverse would be a transtectal fracture where like uh, if i am not sure about the reduction on both limbs and another one would be an extended posterior wall pattern where it's difficult to read from outside on the posterior side in these cases like i might go i'll probably go anterior fix the simple limb first and then come posterior in case if i'm still not sure about it if i can't read the joint reduction through the posterior wall fragments i might do an ssd so how frequently you have done it that is what i was asking very probably like a five percentage of the time five percentage of these cases yes transfers okay yes then moving to dr nikhil uh, they are very very uncommon to be very honest in my hands uh, in the vast majority of cases i have not done it and again you know i look at the prognosis of the injury itself if the injury is a poor prognosis injury i am quite happy to use um, ancillary methods to assess my reduction rather than to inflict another surgical dislocation on the on the patient although in the hands of uh, you know the the masters they have a 0% complication and a 0% avascular necrosis rate and a 0% non union rate i have inherited several surgical dislocations done in other units with some really significant complications so for this particular pattern i don't think i have done a surgical dislocation even once in the last two years very good dr mehul dr mehul yeah. your opinion on it yeah so i i do them more often uh, probably in about a third of third of the cases so probably be anywhere between 30 and 40% i do a safe surgical hip dislocation um i agree i do it more so for the transtectal and the ones with an extended posterior wall yeah those almost invariably get a a safe surgical dislocation with me <laughs> 
I have okay. a question. I have a question. Uh, yes, doctor. Uh, at what time do you commit to the safe surgical dislocation? Because there is already a damage to the short external rotators because of the posterior wall fracture or maybe a dislocation injury itself. And you did a posterior approach, and then you do a safe surgical dislocation. Does it remain safe anymore? Because we have removed the short external rotators, and now you go from the front. So, yeah, Mayhul, a, maybe I can take the question. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. But again, you know, in the um, in the series uh, by by Gantz's unit, um, they've they've shown it, and other units have also shown it that actually. Um, the blood supply um, isn't affected by doing that. As long as you, we heard from one of the talks earlier, you take um, your short external rotators and your piriformis so one and a half centimeters away. And when you do your greater trochanteric osteotomy, you make sure you leave that little cuff of the glute medius and you leave a little bit of the, um, the bone proximally and in the piriformis fossa. So what I tend to do is I don't, um, I usually go in planning to do um, uh, an osteotomy. The first thing I'll do is identify the sciatic nerve. Second thing I'll do is plan my osteotomy, do my osteotomy, and then I'll, I'll do the extended posterior approach. Because what I don't want to be in a situation uh, being is if I plan to do my osteotomy, if I go in there and I think, well, everything's okay from the back, um, I, you can argue that you you can get away from doing a trochanteric osteotomy, but the reasons why I do it is because of the extended posterior wall, and I don't want to compromise my my um, exposure with that. So I get in and do it straight away. Yeah, I think the uh, uh, Krishna Karan, like the thing is like you need to commit it straight away. I don't think that's it's right, a choice yeah. intraoperatively. So you that, that's the point I wanted to make here. So you need to make a decision preoperatively because absolutely you cannot, you know, then uh, once do the posterior and then come into a thing. And I had a couple of cases where there was intraarticular wall, posterior wall. So there was a transverse fracture, but the wall was intraarticular. So there was no way I was able to pull it out without a safe surgical dislocation. So I did the dislocation first, put the wall, up, pull the wall out, and then put the head back in. So the Two instances where I had to do uh, extended uh, approaches with the guns type of osteotomy. Okay, Dr. Srinivas. Yeah, I never had an opportunity to do uh, safe surgical dislocation in case of transverse fracture. So uh, I have done for other indications, but not for transverse fracture. Okay. So that uh, that means that most of us are very not very keen to do a SSD. Uh, thinking that probably it adds to the surgical insult and uh, that is why we don't want to do it. That's not the only reason. For many of these transfers with extended posterior wall, you can actually distract the hip joint distract and lift up the wall piece and that allows you to assess even a transtectal fracture quite well. So if, if I can assess the fracture yes. well, I would not do an osteotomy. Yes, if the situation is such that I just cannot assess the fracture at all, then obviously what Mehul says is right. But in the vast majority of the cases of these, you can actually lift up the wall piece, distract the hip joint, and you can assess the reduction sufficiently well using fluoroscopy in three views to not to have to do it. Yes, okay. Now the last question, and that is uh, the timing of the surgery. So you have a displaced transverse fracture, with the head incarcerated in between the fracture. So do you think it's a surgical emergency and do you think that it needs to be operated in the first 24 hours? So one by one again, each faculty and why? Dr. Ashok? Yeah, it's not an emergency in the real sense, like, but if you can do it early, you sort of like prevent uh, progressive abrasive damage to the femoral head. But if in case if it's going to be delayed, then uh, considering a lateral traction to keep the head under the dome is probably a wise choice. You can include that in your surgical incision when you go ahead and do a definitive fixation. So more often than not, Dr. Ashok, even with a supracondylar pin and a lateral traction pin, you will not be able to get the head reduced under the dome, which is my experience. If you have any better technique to do it, please share with us. The sense like we, we, we don't find it difficult to reduce it, but the problem is to maintain it under the dome is can be extremely difficult in a transtectal fracture. So like in that case, the only way is to go in and do it at the earliest.
Yes, I could see Dr. Pradeep. Pradeep, we have not heard anything from you today. So let me hear from you. Yeah, uh, so yeah. I just wanted to make a comment on the, the last question, I think, uh, regarding the SSD, and then I can come yes. on the, uh, regarding the SSD, uh, if you see Gans's original paper, uh, the now for which he had described for the SSD for acetabular fractures, uh, he has shown that the results, um, the excellent and good results are, they are not better than the traditional techniques. And that too, after uh, um, Gans has particularly mentioned that um, the surgeons which are doing it have done at least 40 cases for non-traumatic indications. So uh, if you are not done that 40% uh, cases, or if you are not a high volume surgeon, then even the, um, the result of SSD may not be as good as his series, which are equal to any, any way the traditional methods. So that one thing we need to uh, keep in mind. Uh, reading the second question, uh, can you repeat it, please? Yeah, means how, how much you are in a hurry if you have uh, such a fracture where yeah. the head is incarcerated. Uh, yeah, so the thing, yes, as early as possible, as early as possible. Uh, and how would you get a close mm -hmm. reduction? Uh, the, the, if, the, if we try to give the lateral uh, traction again, it can create a lot of problems. So what we can do is we can give a longitudinal traction and then we can give a lateral traction. If at all, if you want to displace a fragment a little bit more, you can do that just to de uh, disimpact the fragment because the, the head sometimes get three-dimensionally jam-packed against the medial edge of the iliac fragment. So to disimpact that, you may have to little bit push again inside and then give longitudinal traction to get it out. Uh, one one comment on uh, the last question, Pradeep. Like, uh, yes, uh, I agree with the GAN series thing, but like if you look at the subsequent paper from Burn, from the same group, like uh, they actually show a much higher incidence of satisfactory reductions compared to whatever published before. And another thing that we were discussing is like, it's not about using SSD as a technique of reducing the other side alone. It was about assessing your reduction as well. Mm -hmm. So to assess your yeah. reduction, SSD yeah, is not definitely. a very difficult technique. So Ashok, you know, the second paper that came from Burns that showed a substantially increased. Do you know who reviewed that paper and accepted it? Who knows? Gans? It had come to me for review. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> and there was no way I could reject it. They showed 93% if I'm wrong, if I'm correct. And there were, there were some things that I had to ask them, some questions which they addressed, and then we had to accept it as a second review. Okay. So I think we have had a very nice session and I wish to thank all the faculty, especially Dr. Mehul and Dr. Nikhil who have joined us from the UK and Dr. Krishna Kiran and Dr. Srinivas who have joined us from Hyderabad, Dr. Ashok who has joined us from Chennai, Dr. Pradeep and Dr. Sandeep who have been from Mumbai and myself a host from the hottest spot of COVID in India now, that is Ahmedabad. So... <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, we hope to see you again uh, on subsequent uh, similar platform. Thank you. Even thank COVID you. knows where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. See you guys. Stopping. Thank you. Okay, Stopping. bye, Stopping. bye.